Right. Welcome back after the Pesach holiday. And let's just tell our friends that we've begun. They should come and join us. A small crowd tonight. We'll tell everybody that we started again. Um, I'm going to speak tonight about Jewish food. So I have to tell you just a little joke about Jewish food for one moment. You have this little Jewish guy, and he's sitting on a park bench, and he's eating herring. You know herring? What herring is? Fish. You know fish, you know? Nice herring, salty herring. And this rich person sits down next to him, sees this little poor little Jew eating the herring. He says to him, you know, you Jews are so smart. How come you're so smart? What does it make the Jews so smart? And this little Jewish guy goes, well, the truth of the matter, it's the food that we eat. He goes, it's the food? He says, yeah, in fact, this herring that I'm eating, that's what makes us very, very smart. So this rich man says, can I try some? So the Jewish guy said, well, it will cost you. He goes, well, how much? Well, $50 for three pieces. $50 for three pieces? What are you, crazy? Look, you want to be smarter, don't you? He said, okay, okay. He pays the money. He takes a bite of the herring. He looks at this little Jew and he says, hey, wait a minute. I don't feel any smarter. He goes, I think you tricked me. And Jew turns to him and says, ah, see, it's working. <laughs> <laughs> My other joke about food is that um, in Russia, you know, sometimes in Russia they would kick the Jews out of the country, you know, like expulsions. So one time they would want to expel the Jews. You've got to follow this. You've got to watch this. One time they want to expel the Jews. And, you know, girush. And these, this, the priest says, unless the Jews can defeat me in a debate, I'm going to expel them from the country. So no one wants to debate the priest. Finally, there's one little Jew, Shmulek, the shoemaker. He says, okay, I'll do it. So Shmuel goes into the priest, and he walks into the room where the priest is, and the priest looks at him and goes, Shmuel looks back and says, and then the priest goes, and Shmuel goes, and then the priest takes out some crackers and some wine, and he eats the cracker and drinks the wine. Shmulek reaches into his bag. He takes out an apple. The priest looks up and he says, The Jews have defeated me. The Jews won the debate. The Jews can stay. And Shmulek goes and he leaves. And everyone comes up to the priest. What do you mean? What happened? How did they defeat you? He said, These Jews are so wise. I told this Jew that God is three parts. The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. He said, No. God is one. I told him that God is everywhere. He said, but not in hell. I said, the only way you could have atonement is if you eat the body, the cracker and the blood, the wine of Yashka. He said, he took out an apple and said, but wait a minute, there was no sin in the Garden of Eden. The Jew won. These Jews, they're so wise, they could stay. The Jew, so Shmuel goes back to his town and they're all rejoicing. They hear the good words, you know, the good news that they could stay. And he turned to Shmuel and said, what happened? What did you say? And Shmuel says, I really don't know. He, goes, he said, you have three days to leave. I said, not one of us goes. He said, I want you out of the borders. I said, we're not going. And then we had lunch. <laughs> okay, Jewish food. <laughs> Let's talk about real Jewish food, matzah. I call this class from macaroons to macaroni. Taking home the message of the matzah. Let's go like this. What makes matzah matzah? Why is matzah different than bread? What's the difference? The difference is? It's not fake. It's not fake? Let's think, how do we make matzah? The recipe for matzah is as follows. You take any of the five grains, wheat, spelt, barley, oats, or rye, you combine it with water. And uh, what happens normally, when you combine any of these five grains with water, what's going to happen is, is there's going to be a chemical reaction. It will create glucose. And from the glucose, there will be carbon dioxide. And the carbon dioxide will cause a rise to take place. That's what's natural. That's what causes bread to be bread. Sometimes we want to really stimulate that rise. We want to make a really you know, rich cake. We want to make tandoori bread, something like that. What do we do? We throw in some yeast. 
and the yeast therefore adds is bacteria, and the bacteria causes an even greater chemical reaction, more carbon dioxide, and causes it to rise even more. Matzah is we prevent that chemical reaction from taking place. Basically, we add these grains, any of these five grains, to water, but before it can produce carbon dioxide, what we do is we start kneading it and manipulating it, you know, and pushing it, and we get it into the oven all within 18 minutes. And by doing so, we prevent the rise from taking place. That's why matzah is a food which isn't natural. It's a food which goes above nature, meaning what? It's natural for wheat to want to rise. It's unnatural to prevent the rise. So there's an important message in that. What's the message? The message of matzah is, or one of the messages we're going to see tonight, one message of matzah, hey, how are you? Look at this here. Oh, look at this here. How are you? One of the messages is, it's a message which says that the job of a Jew and the job of life is to be able to fight what's natural about yourself, to fight nature, to fight the nature of you. You know, we know that if we look at ourselves and we examine ourselves closely, we know that we have a lot about us which is very similar to the animal kingdom. In fact, our DNA is almost identical to the ape. Yet we're not apes. The animal wants to eat, we want to eat. Animal wants to drink, we want to drink. Animal has drives, passions, we have drives, we have passions. Animals get angry, right? Animals sometimes want to be the first, like a horse wants to be the first in a race. We also want to be the first. We have covet, glory, honor. We have very things that are very similar to an animal. Ta'avot, all these sort of type things, drives and desires. But what makes us different from the animal kingdom? What makes us different from the animal kingdom is we have souls. We're bodies, we're not bodies with souls, we're souls with bodies. The challenge of life is a challenge to fight nature, to fight the animal. Fight that animal inside you. Rule it. Don't have it rule you. That's what we say in Hebrew. The word for king in Hebrew is, Nick? Melech. So people who speak Hebrew appreciate this. Melech is three letters. Mem, Lamed, Chof. Mem stands for Moach, brain. Lamed stands for Lev, heart. Chof stands for Kloim, which are your intestines, intestines kidneys. Very good. Very good. The idea of a Melech, a king, is somebody who puts his brain, his Moach, above his Lev, above his emotion, and both above the lower part of his body, his passions. That's kingship. Rulership of the brain, of ideas of God's word over our emotion, and both ruling over passions. If you spell the word melech backwards in Hebrew, chaf lam and mem, it spells kilem, which means lachlim, which means disgusting. It means disgusting. Klima. Something which, if a person allows the animal side of themselves, the passions or their emotions to rule their mind that's disgusting that's not living a life that's worth living a life worth living is to be ruled by the brain and have that rule the emotion channel the emotion and channel our passions that's what a melech is all about and that's why it says in the Zohar that the human being is the only animal in creation that stands upright why? because the way we're positioned teaches us a very important lesson, the head has to be above the heart and both have to be above the lower part of ourselves, our passions. All other animals walk on all fours, meaning the head, the heart, and the passions are all on the same line. There's no fight. It's all instinct. The human being has to be ruled by what's above. So we walk straight up. So God gives us little help. You know, it's a way to help us. God's assisting us in this understanding. Because it's, it's strange to walk straight up if you think about it. It doesn't make much sense. It makes a lot more sense to walk on all fours. Standing up is very difficult. We have to have a light bone structure. We have to have a sense of balance. Balance happens to be where? In your ear. In your ear. What's the word for ear in Hebrew? Ozen. Ozen. What's the word for balance in Hebrew? Ishtar. No, the word for scale? Ishtar. Izen. Ozen. 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 
Right? The word for ears and the word for balance is the same word, same shosh in the Holy Tongue. Why? Because the ear is the source of both physical balance and spiritual balance. Spiritual balance because by listening to God's word, we find the path in life, and physical balance because that's where the water is. So it's interesting that the Hebrew language knew that that's the point of physical balance. Why? Because modern science discovered that when? About 50 years ago. Uh, yeah, something like that, 70 years ago maybe? And we've had it in the Hebrew tongue for the last 5,765 uh, years. Nice coincidence. Okay. But the creator who designed the system gave us the language. So of course he knows it's the source of balance. There's no contradiction, no problem. But the challenge of the human being is to be a king, to be a melech. Okay? That the mind should rule the emotion, and together they should rule over the passions. You know, men and women sometimes make mistakes, women in one area, men in another area. An area where women can oftentimes make mistakes is in the area of being too emotional. And therefore, emotion can rule intellect, right? Make the wrong decisions because they get emotionally involved. True? Men can make mistakes sometimes because they get too caught up in their head and they don't bring the heart there at all. And as a result, they also don't have proper clarity. The proper state of being is where the head is above, but you're in touch with your heart, and together you control the passion of who you are. Now, it's interesting. Matzah teaches us, the lesson of matzah, is the lesson that in order to become somebody who is spiritually great, you have to rule over nature. You have to rule over yourself. And that's not an easy task in life to rule over yourself. That's a challenge. You know, ruling over yourself has many, many levels. One level is, for example, you know, if a person walks by a non-kosher pizzeria and you smell the pepperoni pizza and you choose not to have it, that's kingship. I'm not going to be controlled by my stomach. I'm not going to be controlled by my desire. I'm going to be controlled by something much greater, God's will. That's kingship. Whenever you pass by a non-kosher pizzeria and you don't eat it, you've demonstrated an aspect of a king. Or if a person says, look, you know, I choose not to marry this person. Why? Even though she or he is handsome or beautiful, but they're not Jewish. Right? A person is saying, I'm not going to be ruled by my desires. I'm going to be ruled by a mission, a vision of something greater. That's kingship. And that's what the Torah is all about. Becoming kings. But to become a king, you have to be willing to rule over the animal of who you are. <coughs> and I'll tell you a secret. The greatest pleasure in life is the pleasure of overcoming yourself. When you do what's right and you don't give in to temptation, it's an amazing pleasure. God wired us in a way, we're programmed in a way, that we get such pleasure by fighting the animal of who we are. We get very little pleasure by acting like animals. And not only that, if we really want respect from people, we gain tremendous respect when we fight animal temptations. I'll give you an example of what I mean. I remember when I was in college, so back then they used to have, I think they had a banana eating contest. Who can eat the most bananas? I think somebody won by eating something like, I don't know how many, like 300 bananas, something like that. Now, at the end of the day, do you respect that person or you don't respect that person? The guy is on the front page of the paper. He ate 300 bananas. Do you respect the person? I respect him. Right? Why do you respect him? That's pretty good. The only problem is, you know, a chimpanzee could do it much better. <laughs> Anything the animal kingdom can do better than we can do, we have very little respect for. Like I remember in college, you know, at the certain fraternity house, they used to have this like, they stacked up the beer cans from the whole semester, you know, on the wall. There must have been thousands of beer cans up there, you know, oh, look what we accomplished. You know, I'll tell you something, the fish can do it much better. Fish could probably drink more. It doesn't engender our respect. You know, one time I was at a Bukharian wedding, and they brought out a whole lamb. And 
I, I was surprised. You know, what we can do with this lamb now. You know, maybe the Pesach offering or something. But I wasn't sure. But supposing somebody came up to you and said, guess what, you know, I ate a whole lamb. Would we respect that person? No. Why? Because a mountain lion could do it better. Anything an animal can do better than we can do, we don't respect it in a person. Isn't that true? You know, even in sports, I'll tell you something true about sports. You know, you could take the, 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 you know, the greatest wrestler. Who's the greatest wrestler today? I don't even know who it is anymore. Is it Andrew the Giant? Is there, I see like an old man right now. You know, who is it? But you could take the strongest wrestler. But you know what? That strongest wrestler, you pit him against a, um, a mountain gorilla. He'll lose. He'll lose. He will lose. You put him against a bear, he will lose. Or you take the fastest swimmer, you put him against a dolphin, he will lose. Or you take Michael Jordan, and you want to watch how high he can jump, and you put him next to a kangaroo, kangaroo will jump higher. So, you know, it's interesting. Even in the sports, in the world of sports, and we like sports, I like sports, even in the world of sports, we don't respect people necessarily because of what they can accomplish physically, because animals can do it better. What we do respect, and I personally respect in sports about people, is when they play with fairness, or they play with sacrifice, you know? Are they team players? You know, or the guy chooses not to shoot but to pass. You know, he's giving up his own honor that the guy should get the point, not him. That's what I respect. That's what we really respect. When a guy plays for the team, or the guy pushes himself beyond his endurance, you know? He's injured, but nonetheless, he cares enough about the team that he tries his hardest. That's a human quality. That's not an animal quality. He's sacrificing himself. So even in the world of sports, we don't admire people who act like animals. Why? Because intuitively, instinctively, we know that the essence of who we are is not the animal. The essence of who we are is something much greater, and that's the soul. And when the soul directs the animal and harnesses the animal, ooh, we could use all these energies and all these passions in the service of Hashem, in the service of pleasure and beautiful things in this world, and it's a great thing. But just to live a life of animals is a miserable, terrible life, and you get very little pleasure out of it. I want to take you right now, just on a little journey, and I want to take you back to the Garden of Eden for a moment. And listen carefully to me, because I'm going to say something to you which might be disturbing. Let me ask everybody a question. We've heard of the Satan, the Sultan. Is the Sultan a good guy or a bad guy? The Satan. Is he a good guy or a bad guy? Good guy or bad guy? Who says he's a bad guy? Bad guy? Okay, you're learning. Never play Simon Says with me, right? <laughs> The Satan happens to be a good guy. Not only is he a good guy, he's our best friend. The Satan's job is to be our adversary, to be our opponent, in order that we should have more free choice and we should get more reward. In order to get reward forever, there has to be a challenge. You know, if a person says, look, you know, I get a lot, I love playing soccer, like Arsene over here, and he goes out one night to the soccer field, and there's a big, you know, goal post, goal, he takes a soccer ball, he keeps kicking it in, kicking it in, he says, look at that, you know, I keep scoring left and right. So I look at him, I say, like, well, what's the big deal? There's no goalie, right? In order for something to be meaningful, there has to be a challenge. There has to be someone trying to stop you. Oh, then if he can score and get by the goalie, then he's somebody, get by the fullback, you know? Then he's somebody. Am I impressing everybody with my knowledge of soccer? Here, right? I'll show you the rabbis know a little sports. That's about it. I just ended my knowledge. But right, that was it. But if there's a challenge in life, then the game is meaningful. What the Satan does is he tests us and challenges us. But he's really working for a God. Now, I tell you this because in Christian thought, Christians believe that the Satan is a force independent of God. Somehow there's this force called the satanic force that operates in the world independent of God. 
We Jews say no, chas v'sholem. Twice a day we declare, what? Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. Hashem is one. What does it mean that God is one? It means that everything in the universe is being controlled by God. The Satan also. It's a force that God created to test our free choice. Okay? And that's why the Satan is really our best friend. And that's why the Satan is the only angel that's happy when we don't listen to him. All angels are happy when we listen. The Satan is happy when we don't listen. He doesn't want us to listen. He wants to test us, but not that we should fail the test, because he wants us to succeed. And that's why it says in the days of the Mashiach, it says God is going to shech the Satan. He's going to do ritual slaughter on the Satan. So what does that mean? Not that he's going to murder the Satan. He doesn't need him anymore. Oh, he's going to say, he's going to elevate it. Just like Shechita takes a cow and elevates it to a higher position that we therefore can enjoy it and use it. He's going to elevate, so to speak, the Satan back to a position where we're going to realize he was working for us all along. We're going to realize that he was our greatest ally. He was intensifying our free choice, so we should have more reward. Okay, that's the Satan. He's a robot, he's a computer, he's God's angel, he's working to intensify our free choice. Now let's go back to the Garden of Eden for a moment. In the Garden of Eden, God created a snake. This snake was the, contained within him, the Satan. The snake was the Satan. Now this snake was a very interesting snake. It wasn't a snake like we have today. This snake was a very elevated creature that can walk, and talk, and speak with you, discuss things with you. A very elevated animal, the most elevated animal of the entire animal kingdom. Almost like an animal that was almost human, but not human. As close as you can get, as close as you can get to the human being, but yet not be human. That was the snake. But the snake was also the Satan. Same thing. Elevated animal and snake. Now, his job was to test Eve and Adam to eat of the tree. Now, listen to how he tried to test them. He said something very interesting. Listen to the words. In Hebrew, the words are, ki ama elokim. And even if God said, don't eat, period. That's all he said. Ki amar elokim lo What did he leave out? What did the Satan leave out? Even if God said don't eat, what's he implying? You know what he's implying? He's implying even if God said don't eat, who cares what God said? Why don't you be an animal like me? Imagine if the animal world could talk to us. What might the animal world say? The animal world might look at us and say, you know, aren't you an animal? Don't you have drives? Don't you have desires? Don't you have passions? If the animal world could speak to us, the animal world might say to us, why don't you join us and be an animal? You know, and that argument from the animal world wouldn't be a bad argument. You know why? Because there's so much of us which is like an animal. And that's what the snake says. Even if God said don't eat from the tree. Well, don't you have drives like I do, like the animals do? Look at that. Doesn't that look tasty? Doesn't that smell great? Doesn't it look so colorful? Doesn't your stomach just start getting excited when you start looking at that fruit? Like I got excited when I saw that pluff tonight. I'll tell you, when I saw that, I had to drive that pluff and got in over here and I had it in supper. I was going crazy in the car, you yeah. know? Something inside you. Animals also get excited. I have an animal. That, that's part of the animal of who we are, right? You get excited by food. That's, the safe, that's what the snake is saying. Look, who cares what God said? God said don't eat it. But why are you following what God said? Maybe, God, you should follow the animal in who you are. Aren't you an animal? You're an animal, aren't you? So why don't you live like an animal, like us? That's what the snake is saying, which is a very interesting argument. Because these drives that God created... Unlike the other 14,999 religions out there, there have been 15,000 known religions in the last 3,000 years. 15,000. 14,999 of them say that the physical world is something which is very evil and bad. We Jews say no. 
these drives to eat, these drives for pleasure, these drives for the opposite sex. These are drives which God created which are wonderful. Wonderful drives. They're great drives. But you've got to harness them and direct them. But they're drives that can bring you to amazing holiness. We don't say they're evil at all. So the snake is an animal. And he's saying, look, why don't you be an animal? Didn't God create all these wonderful drives in you? So go for it. Go for the drives. Be an animal. You're also an animal. Let you express these drives. Why do you have to listen to what God said? Be the animal who you are. You know, I mentioned this at St. John's today. I was once listening to a radio station, radio show. And on the radio show, the, the uh, announcer, the, um, the host, he was interviewing a kid, somebody from the Christian right. And he was asking this boy why he has chosen to <coughs> remain celibate before he gets married. Right? Not to engage with somebody from the opposite sex. Why he has chosen this. And this boy from the Christian right, he said, it's what I believe. So the host, the radio host, turns to him and says to him, but wait a minute. He says, aren't you an animal? Don't you have animalistic drives? Didn't God create these drives? Why do you want to suppress the natural drives that God created? Where did this argument originate? With the snake. That was the argument that the snake used. If God created these natural animalistic drives, why don't you go for it? Why do you want to fight what's natural? That's what this radio host said to this kid. The exact argument of the snake to Eve. You hear how it works? That's a very, very compelling argument. Even if God said, don't eat, who cares what God said? Be the animal, because you're also an animal like us. And that's the question that the snake, the Satan, was posing to Adam and Eve. Be an animal. Don't rule the animal, be the animal. Now, I want to ask everybody a question. If the snake was in fact the Satan, and the Satan is God's angel, and he works for God, why was the snake punished? How can you punish an angel who's a robot, who's a computer, for doing exactly what it's supposed to do? What's that? <laughs> okay, I heard you saying there's a Zohar like that. But on a simple level, why is the Satan punished for doing its job? You know, it's almost kind of ridiculous if you think about it. Like if I, you know, if I take my bread maker and I program my bread maker to go off after one hour, and my bread maker goes off after one hour just like I programmed it to do, and all of a sudden I say, ooh, why did I do that? I'm so mad at you, bread maker, for going off to one hour. So I pull out the plug and I rip off the legs, you know, and I throw it on the floor. People would look at me and say, you know, that's crazy. You programmed it to do that. So don't be upset at for doing what you programmed it to do. How could God be upset at the snake when God programmed this angel, so to speak, to test Adam and Eve? And how he tests Adam and Eve, that's up to him. You know, he could test them this way, that way. But the point is test. And this was a very, very good test. What are you? Are you a soul or are you an animal? What's the real you? Why don't you be an animal like me? You have passions? I have passions. Go and express your passions. Eat the fruit. Forget about the intellect. Forget about what God said. That's a very good test. So how could God punish the snake for doing what the snake was programmed to do? Didn't he force them? More than one. No, they didn't force them. They didn't force them. Get in the back? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I got... I, I... Somebody told me the answer, he says the answer, why the snake got punished, it's because he's, so the, he doesn't blame, so it means they, um, Eve doesn't blame him, you know, so he can't say, why didn't you punish him, it was his idea also to eat, you know, he, he made me do it, why, why did, didn't he get punished for it, or something in that category. Mm -hmm. Didn't he taste it too? So it was? Okay, that, that's, that's interesting, that, 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 right, if you hear the way the conversation goes, what's your name again? Mike? Yeah. Mike. Mike. Mike's saying something interesting. Listen to the way the dialogue flows, and you hear something very interesting. First of all, God turns to Adam and says, Adam, why did you eat of the fruit? And what does Adam say? Well, Adam says, Aisha, Shana, Sasi, Madi, he Adam says those terrible words of ingratitude. The woman that you gave to me to stand beside me, she gave it to me. 
So Adam, you know, Shem turns to Adam and said, look, you know, on the, it was wrong enough that you should eat. But the second crime is, can't you at least have a little gratitude? I gave you this wonderful person, Eve, to be your helpmate, and you blame it on her? Okay. Tremendous act of ingratitude. It's the first act of ingratitude in human history. Then God turns to Eve and says to Eve, Eve, why did you eat from the fruit? And what does she say? She said, the snake? Hishiani. The snake deceived me. Again, denying responsibility, which God did not like. Then God turns to the snake, and this is what he says to the snake. He says to the snake, he says to the snake, because you did this, I'm going to cut off your legs and you're going to crawl on the ground. How come God never asks the snake why he did it? Because he knows why he did it. He was programmed to do it. Just like I don't ask my bread maker, well, why did you go off for one hour? Because I programmed you to go off after one hour. So why is it punished? Oh, very good question. So how can he punish the snake? That's a very, very good question. It's a very, very good question. So I'm going to share with you an answer that Rav Hirsch says. Shav Shem Raphael Hirsch says this. Great German rabbis, 1850. He says as follows. He says, who says the snake is punished? God's not punishing the snake. You can't punish a computer. You can't punish a robot. You can't punish an angel. And you can't punish the snake. So what is God doing? God is teaching mankind a lesson. God is teaching mankind the argument that the snake posed to you to be an animal. That argument has no legs to stand on. We're taking the base of that argument away. That argument is baseless. Let's knock off the support of that, that argument right there. Let's remove the legs of that argument. The snake isn't being punished. The snake is being reduced so that we should understand that the argument the snake posed, join us and be an animal, is totally baseless. It has no leg to stand on. See how it works? It's not a punishment. It's teaching mankind a lesson. And God goes even further. God makes the snake so unhuman-like, we'll never ever make that mistake again. God takes this animal that was so lofty and so human-like in form, an animal that you just wanted to, you know, cuddle up with at night, you know? And God turns it into a reptile, something which is disgusting to us. I've never met a person besides Lord Voldemort who likes snakes, right? It doesn't happen. Besides who? Lord Voldemort. Oh my gosh, it's very embarrassing. The rabbi knows more than the congregation over here. Come on. Not a Harry Potter. No, no, okay. He likes snakes, Lord Voldemort. But in any case, when you look at a reptile, you know, the fascination we have of going to the reptile you know, house at the Bronx Zoo is a fascination to see something which is really weird. Something so unlike the human being that it's interesting. You look at a reptile, you look at a, a snake, it, it's, it's interesting only because it's so not us. So God takes the snake which was so elevated, and God is teaching us an important lesson, and teaching us that argument that the snake used, which is to be an animal, is so wrong, never make that mistake again. That argument is baseless, it has no legs to stand on, and not only that, I'm going to reduce this animal into something which is so unhuman-like, you'll never ever think again that the animal and I are one and the same. That's what's happening. Now it's very interesting, you know, if you go back in the storyline even further, before God, God gives a commandment, He gives the commandment to eat of every tree in the garden, except for one, and then all of a sudden God says, you know what He says? He says, it's not good for man to be alone, I should find him a wife, a helpmate. And then God brings all the animals before Adam, and Adam names all the animals. The Medrash says that not only does Adam name all the animals, he's able to speak to them. He speaks to the animals, he speaks to them, he names them, but it says something even more fascinating. It says that he is intimate with all the animals. He tries to mate with all the animals. A very bizarre statement in the Medrash. Like Adam is trying to marry the hippopotamus, you know? He's trying to marry the walrus. He's trying to marry the pan. Didn't God, in his, God's infinite wisdom, know that sometimes it's not going to be a good shidduch between Adam, you know, and, 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 you know, Adam and a kangaroo? Didn't God know this? 
I mean, I'm sure all of you probably have this experience when you're going on dates. You're on a shidduch, you're on a date, and looking across the table and thinking like, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, hippopotamus would have more in common than me and her, you know, or him and me. Like, you know, what was the shachin thinking? Like, you might be thinking that sometimes. But certainly God, in his infinite wisdom, knows that, uh, you know, the animal kingdom and Adam just don't miss, mix. Like, you know, so what was God doing? What was the plan? What was God trying to teach? So God was trying to teach Adam something very interesting. God was trying to show Adam that you will never find in the animal world a creature that's like you. You are totally separate from the animal kingdom. And therefore, after Adam, it says, names the animal kingdom and, and tries to see if his wife will come from the animal kingdom and fails, obviously. So then God turns and says, okay, let's make Eve. And takes the side of Adam and splits it and brings forth his wife, Eve. But the message that God's trying to communicate to Adam is that you and the animal world are totally separate. The animal world and you do not belong together because you have a soul and you have an intellect and you have to use your mind and your soul to rule over your nature, to rule the animal. And that's the way you're going to grow in life and that's the way you're going to be happy and that's the way you're going to accomplish your mission. So that's one thing that Matzah teaches us. Yeah, we'll do. One thing that matzah is teaching us is matzah is a food in which God says for seven days you have to eat a food in which you rule over nature. Don't let it rise. To teach you that the job of life is to rule nature. To rule that which is natural. To rule the animal. And God loves that. God loves that about us. There's a famous statement that what we love about God is when God changes nature for us what God loves about us is when we control our nature for Him. That's what God loves about us. We love God when He changes nature for us. He splits seas. What God loves about us is when we control our nature for Him. Because that's the essence of being human. And that's the challenge and struggle of life. And that's the mission and vision of Torah. To harness the animal in the service of God. Not to let the heart and the passions rule you, but to have God's word rule your heart, and together God's word and your heart should rule your passions. That's one message, the lesson of the matzah. Let me give you three more lessons in a short period of time. Another lesson of matzah is a very interesting lesson. The lesson of matzah is, if you think about it, what does bread have that matzah doesn't have? Yeast. Has yeast which creates Rising. gas, carbon dioxide, which creates air. All bread really is, is flour, water, and hot air. That's all it is, air. The air really has no substance. It's false. There's a falseness in it. And that's why bread is the symbol of arrogance, because arrogance is something which is false. You know, if you look on, if you ever see the great website, you ever go into H.com? Excellent, excellent Jewish website, H.com. So they have a funny movie on uh, Jularius on it. And it, I didn't see it, but somebody told me that this man, this boy is on a date with this lady. And um, he's sitting there at the table. And he's telling her how he's directing his new film. And he's getting all these famous actors to star in the film. And he's going to have it produced in Hollywood. And it's expected to make, you know, $100 million on the first weekend of its release. And the waiter is listening to this. The waiter goes, walks over to the table, takes away the bread, comes back and says, I think you need this. And places a couple matzahs on the table. And then the guy looks at the matzahs and he turns to the girl and he says, goes, actually, I'm just the guy who fetches the Coca-Colas. <laughs> you know, all of a sudden humility and honesty come out. <laughs> bread is the symbol of arrogance and falseness. Matz is the symbol of humility and honesty because it's saying, I am what I am. And there's nothing false about it. And I don't need anything from the outside. I don't need any yeast. I don't need any air to make me bigger than what I am because I know what I am. So it's very interesting. Another message of matzah is a message that says that in order to be happy in this world, one has to know who they are. 
Don't try to find happiness by looking for approval outside of yourself. You know, oftentimes people play to the crowd or they feel they're only special if people notice them. The message of matzah is know exactly what you are. That's what humility is. Humility is I know what I am. I'm bread and water. That's it. That's it. I know what I am. I don't need anything from the outside to define me. You know, and when a person lives their life like that, that's another aspect of freedom. That's freedom. Freedom is I don't need you to approve of me in order for myself to be happy because I know who I am. You know, that's like, you know, if you go to college and somebody pulls up to the college in his 2008, you know, red BMW, you know what my first reaction is? My first reaction would be, that guy is a slave. Why? Because he is a slave to me. He needs my wow. He needs my oohs and ahs. He has no confidence in himself. He has no self-worth. His self-worth is only if I tell him that I love his red BMW. Supposing I go over to this guy and I say, uh, I don't know, nice set of wheels you got there. Uh, my grandmother has the same model. <laughs> I've ruined this guy's day. I've made him ruin this guy's month, you know? Why? Because he's my slave. He's my slave. Matzah says freedom means that you know exactly who you are and you don't need anything from the outside to give you definition, to define you. Bread needs something outside. It needs air to build it up. Matzah doesn't need anything to build it up. It is what it is. It's bread and it's water. There's nothing false. There's nothing external. There's nothing that gives it meaning except what it is. And that's humility. Humility means I know who I am. And one's truly free when one can say, I'm going to live my life the way I want to live my life, regardless of what people say. That's freedom. You know, it's also the purpose, by the way, for modest dress in Judaism. The reason why we Jews dress modestly and have laws of tzniot is to teach this lesson. The lesson is that I know who I am from the inside, and I don't need your oohs and ahs from the outside to define me. And the reality is, you know, if you look in the world today, and you see people dressed in ways which are trying to show off their bodies, my first reaction is, it's really sad, because those people are slaves. They're slaves. They're dependent on other people's approval to give themselves happiness. Jewish modesty and Jewish dress says that I know who I am from the inside. I don't need your approval on the outside to bring me joy and happiness. So matzah is the bread of humility. It's the bread of honesty. And it's the bread of freedom. Why? Because it teaches the aspect that true freedom means that I'm free when I don't need anything from the outside to define me. I know who I am from the inside. It's a very important lesson. A very important lesson. And it's an important lesson for marriage also. Happiness in marriage, one should not look for the spouse to give them happiness. Happiness is a function of knowing who you are on the inside. And not looking for one's husband or wife to define us and to make us happy. Freedom is freedom only when you know who you are and you don't need anyone else to give you that definition. That's another lesson of matzah. A third lesson of matzah is, if you think about it, it's very interesting that when God took us out of Mitzrayim, He took us out of Egypt, He took us out in a very interesting way. The food that we ate as slaves, what was the food that we ate as slaves? Matzah. Why did we eat matzah as slaves? We ate matzah as slaves because we were always working. You know, we didn't have the luxury to let our wheat rise. We had to put the wheat with water and eat it. It was a very flat bread. We didn't have the luxury to let it sit and rise and become a delicious bread. We were always working, you know, doing our jobs. People were oppressing us, nogshim. Now it's interesting. When God frees us from Egypt, what does He do? He frees us in a way that we also don't have time to let our bread rise. You know, what happens? God says, okay, everybody, I'm getting ready to take you out of Egypt. 
you know, get your flour, get your water, start making your bread. So what do we do? We get our flour, we get our water. He goes, okay, start making bread. We put the flour with the water. All of a sudden, what does God say? Go! Couldn't God have waited 18 minutes? Couldn't he have at least let us go out with bread? Or couldn't God have given us the commandment the night before and said, you know, prepare your bread? Why does God redeem us in a way in which the exact same bread that we ate in Egypt becomes the exact same bread of freedom. What's the concept? What's the idea? Alex? It's like how it sounds like we're still slaves. Not like slaves to a master, but like, I mean slaves to slaves, but now we're slaves to a master. Oh, so that's a very interesting concept. I was exactly what I was going to say. What Alex is saying is like this. The reason why God has the bread of slavery become the bread of freedom is because he's teaching us something about freedom. Matzah teaches us about what freedom really is. There is an aspect of being free which also requires some level of servitude. Now what does that mean? To be a slave to an Egyptian, obviously that's not freedom. But you know what's true freedom? True freedom is if one becomes a I'm going to use a word in English, it's not the best word, a servant of God, an evid of God, an evid Hashem. How does that create freedom? Why is that freedom? I'm going to explain to you why. In Hebrew, we have an expression, I'll say the English expression, the expression is to accept the yoke of heaven. What does that mean, the yoke of heaven? How do we spell yoke? Not Y-O-L-K, which would be the yoke of an egg. Y-O-K-E, which is like the yoke that an ox puts on his shoulders. Now, a yoke is something very heavy that an ox wears, and then you tie to that yoke, you tie the plow, and the ox pulls the plow. If anyone's ever been to the Pennsylvania Dutch Amish country, anyone to been to Pennsylvania? Lancaster. You go to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, you go to Pennsylvania, we'll have, a, we'll have an Emmett trip there. You see the Pennsylvania Dutch Amish. And they've chosen a lifestyle in which they actually live like they're, you know, they live in a way that they've rejected modernity to a large part. They don't use tractors in their fields. They don't drive cars. They have horse and buggies. You never been down there? Very fascinating to go. It's about two hours from here. You go to the farmlands of Pennsylvania. They're called the Pennsylvania Dutch Amish. But you watch the way they farm in the field. They actually have these big horses hooked up to these plows with, with yokes. And it pulls it. You can still see it today. It's amazing to see. How people are living. But if I were to tell you, if I were to ask you a question, would everybody, anybody like a yoke? Does anybody like that word yoke? I want to put a yoke around your neck right now and around your shoulders. Any takers? Any takers for the yoke? If I said to you, well, you know, what life is all about is accepting the yoke of heaven. Does that make you feel, is that like a warm, fuzzy word? Or is that a word that feels like Rabbi Kraft, like, I like the pluff, but I'd like to leave tonight. You know, let's get out of here. Like, which does it do to you? I think it's a turnoff, right? <laughs> I don't think any of us would like a yoke around our neck. I say, well, life's all about a yoke of heaven, you know? <laughs> oh, please, you know. Like, it doesn't do much for me. But let me teach you something so beautiful. I'm going to teach you one word in Hebrew. And it's going to totally transform your understanding of this concept. What's the word for yoke in the Hebrew language? Ol. Ayin Lamed. Ol. What words do we know in the Hebrew language which share the same root? Ole. What does Ole mean? To go up. Aliyah. To ascend. Why is a yoke called an ol which means to go up? To ascend. You know why? You have an ox. You have this big animal, right? A thousand pounds of energy. It has so much strength, so much power. It can accomplish so much. But you know what? Unless you harness that energy in a certain way, it's just going to run wild. All, one second. All it's aliyah, Rebbe? All is from the root. Aliyah, Ola. Okay. Rabbi, I know Hebrew very good. Okay. You have Hebrew mistakes. I'm very sorry. Okay. All is no connection to I, 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 I need, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. I'm Mr. Elliot Fakir. I noticed this a few times. I need Mr. Okay. 
Okay, I'm telling you, I'm telling you what it says. I'm telling you what it says. I'm sorry if I'm wrong. Do my best. This is what I know. All is the same root as Oleh. To go up. Listen to it. I am Namid. What else can it be? All it means to go up. The Vilna Gaon says it. The Vilna Gaon says, I'll show you where he says it. You argue with the Vilna Gaon, don't argue with me. All means to go up ascend. The reason is like this. Because you could have this ox, you could have this animal, with all the strength. But if you don't harness that energy, what do you, what, it, it doesn't accomplish anything. But you put a yoke on it, and now it can do something. It can make something great. It can ascend. So God says to us, you know, people, you have all this energy, all these drives, all these passions, all these desires, all these thoughts, this great mind. But if you don't have a way to direct it, you're never going to ascend. What it means, the old Malchut Shemayim, the yoke of heaven means we place God's will Upon ourselves, we direct ourselves to accomplish. Without that, all of our drives and passions could take us in a million different directions. But with the responsibility now of God's word, what do we become? We ascend, we become great. It harnesses all the drive, passions, and energy that we have, just like the yoke harnesses the strength of the ox. And that's where the word for yoke in Hebrew is all. Same word as ascend. Argue with the Vilna Gaon is such a beautiful concept. Beautiful concept. Now, it's interesting. That's why in Hebrew, you know, it's not, I'll give you another example of what I mean. What's the word to get married? Nisuin. What's the word to rise, to, to lift, to go up? Nasa. What's the word to carry a heavy load? Nasa. What's the word to get married? Nisuin. Nasa. The word to get married? Nasa. The word to carry a heavy load? Nasa. The word to rise up? Nasa. Same root in Hebrew. What's God trying to teach us? God's trying to teach us, yeah. Marriage. Marriage is a heavy load. You have responsibility. You've got to care about someone else. You've got to be other-centered. You can't be egocentric. But guess what? That's the only way to become great. It's the only way to rise up. The only way to rise up is if you accept responsibility. A person who doesn't accept responsibility and lives totally for themselves, <laughs> it's sad because they're never going to accomplish anything. They're never going to be great. And that's why it breaks my heart when I see all these old people who have retired, you know, and they had such productive lives, now all they do is sit around and watch television. It breaks my heart. Because growth means that you have responsibility. You have to have a weight. You have to carry something. And that's going to make you into somebody greater. So God's teaching us a very important lesson, Alex, and you hit it exactly. God is teaching us the bread of slavery is going to become the bread of freedom. Why? Because even within freedom... True freedom is when you become now an evid, so to speak, a slave to God. Slave is not the right word, evid. But you channel all your energies in the service of God. That's real freedom. Because I'm just going to go after all my drives and passions, do whatever I want to do. I'm not going to get anywhere in life. I'm going to be a slave to my stomach. I'm going to be a slave to my emotions. I'm going to be a slave to my physical passions. But I'm a slave now to God. I'm going to harness it. And I'm going to use it. And I'm going to become somebody great. And one more lesson I'm going to teach you. One more lesson of the matzah. It's interesting. The matzah, once again, the food that we ate as slaves becomes the food of our freedom. You know what God's trying to teach us? Beautiful lesson. This is the Sforna. What you thought was the symbol of your affliction, of your pain, God is teaching us that it now becomes the slave of your, it becomes the symbol of your greatest joy. What does that mean? The bread you ate, which was the symbol of slavery, God flips it over and says that same bread you're now going to realize is the bread of your greatest salvation. And God's teaching us a very powerful lesson in life. The lesson is, oftentimes in life, we experience things which are painful. It could be a loss. It could be an illness. It can be an emotional trauma. But we're going to understand, and matzah teaches us to have the amuna, to realize what we think is painful. One day we're going to realize that that pain is the source of our greatest joy. What we think is painful, one day we're going to understand, whether it be when Mashiach comes, whether it be just in a few years, whether it be in our lifetime, whether it be after our lifetime. But one day we're going to realize that what we thought was the source of our pain our greatest anguish, boom, 
is the source of our greatest joy. But that takes a muna. That takes a muna. That takes faith. God is teaching us that matzah is the bread of faith. Have trust. The Jews in Egypt saw it in their own lifetime. The bread they ate as slaves in their own lifetime became the bread of freedom. Hopefully we'll see it in our lifetime. The things that we think are painful will be flipped around and we'll realize those same things are the things of our greatest joy. You know, that's why we say, you know, it's, it's interesting that the, when we bench, you know, before we say, when we say Sheha Malot, after we've bred, so we say the words from David Melech, at the time of Mashiach, it says, what do we say? Shiva Malos, B'Shuv Hashem, Et Shivat Zion, Hayinu Kecholmim. When Mashiach comes, we were like dreamers. It doesn't say we will be like dreamers, meaning like, ooh, what a dream, so beautiful. You know what David the Melech is teaching us? He's teaching us, when Mashiach comes, we're going to look back to now, and we're going to say what we think now is bad, we were like dreamers. How could we thought it was bad? We're going to realize exactly what we thought was bad, so perfect and so good, it was exactly what we needed, in either to perfect ourselves or atone for our sin, to bring us where we had to go, whatever it might be. It's like we look at this world and say, I was in a fog in this world. I thought it was bad. I was like in a dream world. When we see the reality, when the Sheikh comes. You know, that's why that beautiful story, I'll just, just say it once again. I just I love the story. Uh, David Ordman tells the story. He says that, you know, that um, his great uncle was leaving Europe and wanted to get out of Europe because of the poverty in Kovno, Lithuania. And this was going back a little under 100 years ago. And he sold all of his property and he sold his house and his business and he put the money into tickets. With these tickets, he bought travel for his family to go from Poland to Lithuania to Warsaw, Warsaw to Odessa, Odessa where there's a port to England, and England to America. So his great uncle got to the train station with his family at 20 to 8 to catch the 8 o'clock train, the train that would take them to Warsaw. When they arrive at the train station, they see the 8 o'clock train chugging away. Chug, 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 chug. And they go to the station master and say, what's happened? Is, uh, what train is that? He says, the 8 o'clock train. It came early today. What do you mean it came early today? It's like, I'm at 8 o'clock. It just came early. I don't know why. He says, when's the next train? There's no next train. That's it. And in those days, it wasn't like today. You know, you miss flight, you know, Pan Am, you know, 21, you take Pan Am 22. In those days, you miss a connecting link you miss it all, and you don't get a refund. And that was it. He's standing there holding tickets for his family that are worthless, and he sold his business, his house, his store, and he has nothing left. <laughs> so he went back to the town, and he was devastated. Devastated. And he didn't know what to do. You know, about a week later, he comes running into the synagogue and says, I have to make a blessing. I said, what blessing? The blessing that you make when your life has been saved. The blessing you say when your life has been saved. So I looked at, what do you mean your life has been saved? You've been in the town for the last week. He said, I just got a newspaper. News traveled very slow. I just got a newspaper. Remember, I was supposed to take a train to Warsaw and Warsaw to Odessa and Odessa to England, and England to America, I just found out that the ship that I was supposed to have traveled on from England to America sank. What, tri what ship was that? Titanic. True story. You know, imagine this gentleman looks up, he watches that train chugging away, chug, 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 chugging away, 20 to 8. He looks like a, I can't believe it. He looks up to the sky, he looks up to God, he says to him, Hashem, what do you want from me? You know, I, I keep Shabbat, I keep Kashrut, I'm raising my children in the way of Torah, I'm a good Jew, I give charity. What do you want from me? Why are you doing this to me? You know, if he could hear God's response, 
Do you know what it might have sounded like? Listen, you big dope. I just saved your life. Not only did I save your life, I saved your wife's life, I saved the life of your children. And if you'll just have a little patience, wait a week, you'll realize exactly what happened. Sometimes in our lifetime, we're able to realize that what we thought was painful is really the source of our greatest joy. And I imagine that this person took this lesson of his own personal salvation and it transformed him in his realization of how much God loved him, that he became a different person. I was able to raise his children in a whole different way. So Matzah is teaching us that lesson. What you think is painful, have patience. One day you're going to realize that what you thought was the source of your greatest pain will be the source of your greatest joy. What was the source of slavery? The bread, the symbol of slavery, will become the bread of freedom. So let's just review. What did we say? Tonight's class was entitled From Macaroons to Macaroni. The lessons of Pesach. And I think these five things perhaps are amongst the many lessons of the matzah. Number one, that matzah teaches us that we have to rule over nature, which means that we have to rule over the animal and who we are. We have to fight the animal, let the soul rule the animal. And that's our job, not to give in to the animal kingdom, not to listen to what the snake tried to convince us with, but to rule the animal. And that's what matzah says, rule over nature. Number two, we understand that bread Matzah is an honest bread. It doesn't need anything from the outside to give it definition and meaning. And we understand the true freedom is when we understand who we are. We don't need the approval of anyone else to give us happiness or meaning in life. Number three, we understand that freedom means not that we run wild like the ox without a yoke, but when we harness ourselves in servitude to God, that's real freedom. Because then we channel ourselves to become something great. And that's why it says, right, the freedom is really only achieved when we receive the Torah. It says, don't read that the words are engraved on the stone, but the words are freed into the stone. The Torah gives us freedom. And finally, number four, we realize that matzah is both the symbol of slavery and the symbol of freedom, and God designed it that way. The bread that we had as slaves, God purposely made to be the bread of freedom to teach us exactly what we think will be, is the source of our pain in life. One day, if we have a little bit of patience, we'll realize it's the source of our greatest joy. Hope everybody had a wonderful young I enjoyed speaking to you, buddy. Thank you very much. One, just one, one announcement to everybody. This Saturday night, again, you know, as, as our friend, as Surin does, 10 o'clock sharp, we're going to have a Eli Mansour lecture on video. The topic is Glat Kosher Goyishkeit. Not sure what that means. And our guest speaker will also be Reb Ilan Meiro. Okay, 10 o'clock here. Pizza is always served as usual Saturday night. Thank you, Melissa, everybody. Have a wonderful